Okay, my name is uh, Eric Johnson. Forgive the beginning of that. I'm trying to figure out how to record this thing in our new virtual meeting setup. I'm a professor of surgery at the Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine at Case Western Reserve University, uh, and I thank the organizing committee for uh, asking me to give this lecture on uh, alternatives to elective surgery in the setting of recurrent diverticulitis addressing the question of, is there really any evidence-based medical management? I have no disclosures uh, other than the fact that in places uh, I will give my opinion. And while that's based in uh, 20 or more years of experience, it may not be backed necessarily by evidence. So I think, uh, first of all, it's important to address you know, which patients we're referring to in this lecture. Uh, you've already heard a number of lectures uh, that have gone into specifics in the setting of diverticulitis. And so it's important to define who we're talking about here. So the, the patient I'm focusing on is, is a patient who's had previous episodes of diverticulitis, uh, namely uncomplicated disease, and currently is either asymptomatic uh, or may have some ongoing chronic symptoms. Um, we also see you know, interesting subsets of patients, uh, one of which may be the patient who just doesn't tolerate uh, recurrent episodes of diverticulitis from a quality of life standpoint, and, and they essentially come to you begging for surgery. Uh, or an interesting one that we see from time to time is, is the patient that gets Clostridium difficile infection every time they get antibiotics to treat diverticulitis. They're an interesting group that really we could go into on their own. And these are really the people uh, that we're discussing. You know, the management paradigm for diverticulitis has changed significantly uh, from the time I was a resident until now. And, you know, really, I think the more knowledge we get, uh, the more questions we have. And, and this, uh, this symposium is, is a great example of, of the questions that have come up and how things have changed over time. And uh, th this lecture, I think, you know, may end up leaving you with more questions and answers as well. So I think there's two major questions uh, that need to be addressed in the setting of this uh, talk. Uh, so number one is, is surgery better than no surgery? And specifically what, what I'm referring to is, you know, patient quality of life and cost. Uh, and the second question is, you know, is there a medical treatment available to us that can prevent recurrence of future episodes uh, and be uh, more cost effective uh, and it, at least is equivalent uh, to in quality of life to surgery. So the first question is, is surgery better? Uh, and there's plenty of evidence out there uh, that addresses this question, uh, unlike question two. And I think if you look at the larger body of evidence, most supports that recurrence of diverticulitis after an initial episode is somewhere between just over 10% and just under 40%. Uh, I don't think anybody would argue that. That's what we tend to see in our practices. Um, and then there are plenty of studies that show recurrence is lower after surgery uh, than those numbers. And specifically, in a 2020 study of just over 600 patients who underwent laparoscopic sigmoidectomy for recurrent diverticulitis, um, at a mean follow-up of 86 months, the rate of recurrence was 4.2%, which is far better uh, than recurrence numbers without surgery. The direct trial was uh, initially published in 2017, and there have been several publications that have um, looked at subgroups or different questions that have uh, arisen from the direct trial. Uh, you know, briefly, it was a uh, randomized controlled trial of laparoscopic sigmoid colectomy versus conservative management in patients who uh, developed uh, acute uncomplicated diverticulitis that was recurrent. Um, and when you look at the data, despite uh, acceptable levels of complications, uh, and considering those complications, as well as some crossover from the conservative to the surgical group, uh, quality of life was better uh, in the surgical group at six months, at one year, and at five years. And that, that's uh, excellent, uh, high-quality data. Uh, the one question that comes up, though, is, is the definition of conservative management, and that's not necessarily uh, super clear. 
They also had a publication where they looked at uh, cost analysis of surgery versus conservative management and basically uh, showed what one would expect that at five years or long term, uh, surgery was far more cost effective than conservative management, uh, but not at one year short term. Uh, again, that, that's direct trial data. Um, and I don't think that is surprising to most of us. <clears throat> so based on the fact that surgery seems to be clearly better than conservative management, you know, many would say, why even ask the second question? And I, there's several reasons to ask. So number one, uh, as I alluded to on the previous slide, uh, conservative management is not well defined in any of these studies. And, and so it was a, it was a mix of whatever, you know, the treating physician wanted to do. So it could have been simply non-operative management or antibiotics or dietary changes or pain control or any combination of the above. Um, and so, you know, there was really no standard set for that. And there certainly were no medical adjuncts used to try and prevent disease. And so I, I think the, the second question is worth asking. Also, there are patients that are simply not surgical candidates uh, and there are people that just don't wanna have surgery. And so if there's a medical option, it's what the patient would prefer. You know, we've had development of improved knowledge in terms of the pathophysiology of diverticulitis over the past uh, several years. And there's clearly a role of chronic inflammation uh, there are even theories that it's a colitis-like uh, disease process, and clearly uh, more recent research has, uh, has defined uh, or at least uh, brought up the issue of the role of the microbiome in uh, either cause or control of disease. And so, you know, one would naturally ask, can these factors be manipulated in any way to prevent recurrences? And, you know, naturally a number of uh, investigators did ask this question um, and mesalamine, which is a 5-ASA compound that's been used to treat um, colitis, uh, has been investigated uh, to see whether or not it can prevent uh, recurring episodes of diverticulitis. And, and so, you know, you take an anti-inflammatory drug with the thought of can this uh, chronic inflammation be eliminated uh, controlled or, or modulated. And a number of randomized trials were performed uh, where mesalamine was uh, compared to placebo. And ultimately, uh, the conclusions are that it probably is not beneficial. Uh, there was a Cochrane review done in 2017 that looked at seven of these randomized controlled trials with approximately 1,800 patients. And the conclusions of that uh, systematic review um, or meta-analysis was that uh, the evidence was low quality overall, and there was an unclear high risk of bias in the studies. And ultimately, there was no significant difference in disease recurrence between the study arms. And so based on, on uh, that excellent uh, meta-analysis, I don't think there's any evidence to support the recommendation of this therapy in terms of a, a preventive therapy. The microbiome is a hot topic, um, and there have been several studies that have looked at uh, manipulation of the microbiome uh, as a potential um, preventive strategy. Uh, the, uh, the drug rifaximin, which is a non-absorbed oral antibiotic, uh, which is actually quite expensive, um, has been looked at as a treatment alone versus placebo uh, or in combination with uh, 5-ASA compounds uh, and or fiber supplementation. Um, and a meta-analysis of, of four uh, reasonably well-done trials encompassing about 1,600 patients um, look, looking at uh, the use of rifaximin uh, plus 20 grams of daily fiber intake uh, did show that there was effect in symptom relief at one year with a relatively small number needed to treat of three. Uh, the one potential issue with this therapy is that uh, it's a long-term therapy and you know ultimately there's no endpoint that's well defined. Um, these studies looked at one to two years of uh, 
treatment for uh, one week out of every month of 400 milligrams of rifaximin twice a day, plus 20 grams of daily fiber intake, which was maintained throughout. Um, you know, obviously, uh, that's expensive. Um, and there are some uh, insurances that won't cover it and patients that would be unable to um, afford that, that therapy. And so that, that's one weakness um, to that approach, but uh, some mildly compelling data. Uh, probiotics, again, thinking along the lines of the microbiome, if the microbiome can be manipulated by adding the right bacteria, perhaps you can uh, prevent disease recurrence. Um, there have been a number of studies that have looked at probiotics uh, versus placebo, um, and a systematic review done in 2016 of 11 studies uh, ultimately concluded that there was insufficient evidence to draw any meaningful conclusions on the use of probiotics in terms of disease prevention. Uh, one problem with these probiotic studies, though, is that, you know, the, the regimens are all over the map. They're varied uh, regimens at varied doses containing varied uh, groups of microorganisms. And so it's, it's really unclear if there's a best combination. Um, and if, if that best combination could be defined, it, uh, it would, would likely be better to study. Uh, you know, and then there's the overall question of, is there a best combination that's applicable to everyone? Or is the microbiome much more of a very unique uh, thing? And so uh, difficult to uh, recommend uh, probiotics in terms of uh, any base of evidence. Uh, a group out of the Netherlands uh, published some guidelines in digestive surgery in 2013. Um, and, and they looked really at all aspects of uh, treatment of diverticulitis. And, uh, you know, I'm going to touch on a couple. So one is, is disease prevention. Um, and they make some low uh, level recommendations based on low quality evidence um, regarding effective exercise regimens, uh, appropriate fiber and water intake, uh, limited red meat intake, low alcohol intake, and non-smoking. Um, and despite the relatively low quality of evidence, the group recommends these things. And I think, you know, they're easy to recommend because we know they're harmless and uh, they're, in fact, very helpful in other aspects of one's health. And uh, they probably do play some role uh, in uh, the pathogenesis of this, of this disease. And so the group recommends those things in terms of prevention. And that's really primary uh, and secondary prevention. Um, they also uh, make some soft recommendations in terms of uh, the use of uh, non-absorbable antibiotics uh, with uh, mesalamine and or probiotics. And, and so specifically in a patient who continues to have residual minor symptoms after an episode of uncomplicated disease, they say that a trial of rifaximin, for instance, with combined with mesalamine and or probiotics is justified. Um, again, likely because of the very low risk of the use of these therapies uh, and minimal side effect profiles um, and the slight possibility that there could be benefit. But again, keep in mind, this is a, a weak recommendation based on very weak evidence. So in conclusion, uh, you know, to this brief talk, I'll give you my thoughts. And so I think there's limited, if any, evidence that supports uh, medical prevention uh, in, the, in the, the primary or, or secondary realm. Um, I think in general, certainly my patient population, and I think the majority in the U.S., have a very poor tolerance of the symptoms associated with recurrent diverticular disease. Um, there's clear evidence that surgery is better in terms of quality of life uh, and uh, cost when compared to um, conservative management in the appropriate setting. Um, and, you know, again, it's, it's probably cheaper over the long term uh, than, than long term use of rifaximin. And so uh, based on, you know, these things, I, I, I don't think there is any real role for uh, medical prevention of recurrent uh, disease. And you just have to take each case individually and in a patient who's got either persistent or multiply recurrent episodes, um, surgery is probably the best approach. But thank you for listening. Hope you enjoyed the presentation.